We choose to go to the moon in this decade and do the other things, not because they are easy, but because they are hard. Because that goal will serve to organize and measure the best of our energies and skills. Because that challenge is one that we're willing to accept, one we are unwilling to postpone, and one we intend to win, and the others do. The moon landing is easily one of the greatest feats that man has ever accomplished, but the sad thing is, is that most people don't know much about it outside of Neil Armstrong's first steps. Knowing this, I wanted to set out and create a series dedicated to the moon landings and the missions that got them there. So I packed up my camera, decided to go on up to Huntsville and visit the US Space and Rocket Center. Here I got to see the rockets themselves and everything it took to get man on the moon. This series will uncover the entirety of the Apollo missions and all the tiny little details, but let's save those for other episodes. Today, we will cover the basics, like what was the Apollo missions. Just 10 years after the end of World War II, the world is now in another, but this time, it's a cold one. The Cold War was not waged like any other war before it, but instead, the battles were waged in culture, economics, fear, and technology. In a battle between the Soviet Union and the United States arose to see who would become the more technologically superior country. This would be known as the space race, and it was started almost as soon as World War II ended. Both the US and the USSR recruited the top scientists from Germany after their surrender because neither wanted to see the other have them. The Soviets were headed up by Sergei Korolev and over 2,000 German engineers and scientists who worked on the infamous German V-2 rocket. The Americans recruited the likes of Werner von Braun and got a nice group of over 1,600 German scientists and engineers. Both sides quickly got to work studying the German V-2 and tried to develop their own. The Soviets formed their own space agency and struck the first blow of the space race, Sputnik 1. This was the first man-made satellite to orbit the Earth and got the US populace heavily involved in the space race. The US quickly answered by putting their own satellite into orbit, Explorer 1, forming the National Aeronautics and Space Administration, or NASA, in 1958. A series of unmanned missions would escalate the space race as both sides were planning to put a man into space. This formed Project Mercury for the US and the Vostok program in the USSR. Before either country accomplished putting a man into space, there was already a plan under wraps that would put the entire space race to an end. A feat so great that the entire world would unite as one and watch along in equal amazement at what humans have accomplished. The feat was to put a man on the moon, and the plan was the Apollo program. The Apollo program was formally announced in July 1960. Eisenhower wanted Project Mercury to have a follow-up that involved three astronauts having the capability to dock in space, orbit the moon, land, and return home. Shortly after, the Apollo program had made great progress in a short amount of time. John F. Kennedy was elected president later that year and his support of NASA would do wonders into bringing the Apollo program into reality. Then on May 25th, just 20 days after Alan Shepard became the first American in space, Kennedy released an urgent message to Congress that said that he wanted to commit this country to landing a man on the moon and bringing him back safely by the end of the decade. Shortly after that, the workforce for NASA doubled. They opened the Marshall Space Flight Center in 1960, the Johnson Space Center in 1962, and the Kennedy Space Center in 1963. The Apollo team quickly got to work thinking up ways to get to the moon. Four plans were debated on how to get us there. There was the Lunar Surface Rendezvous plan, where two crafts would be sent to the moon, one with fuel to get back and the other with the astronauts. Both would land and the astronauts would have to figure out a way to get the fuel from the fuel canisters into the returning craft. The second plan was known as the Earth Orbit Rendezvous, where many different rockets would assemble a single spacecraft in low Earth orbit, then fly it to the moon and back. Later on, a plan similar to this would be used to assemble the ISS in space. A third idea was the Direct Ascent Plan, which would be to directly shoot for the moon without orbiting it. This plan would have required the insanely huge Nova rocket, which was never built. The winning plan was the Lunar Orbit Rendezvous plan where they would orbit the moon and use a lander to go down to the surface. To get back home, they would use a small engine to fire back up and dock with the orbiting part of the spacecraft, then head on home. 
NASA used four different rockets throughout the Apollo program, each with a different purpose. The first one was known as Little Joe 2, and it was used to test the rocket before any of the actual Apollo missions took place. The Little Joe 2 was used to test the LES, or Launch Escape System. It was much smaller than the rest of the rockets, and it could only reach 74,000 feet or 22,600 meters. It flew from 1963 to 1966. The second rocket used and the first heavy lifter was the Saturn 1. The Saturn 1 was used to test the aerodynamics of the LEM and service module that would eventually be placed on the Saturn 5. This was not just a test vehicle though, as the Saturn 1 was also used to launch the Pegasus satellites. Only used from 1961 to 1965, the Saturn 1 flew just 10 times. The Saturn 1B was an improvement of the Saturn 1. This rocket had a J 2's engine in the second stage and an upgraded first stage, which will allow for a payload twice the size of the Saturn 1 to reach orbit. It was used in Apollo 1, 5, and 7, then flown four more times after the Apollo program ended to get crew to the Skylab. Last but not least, we have the king of all rockets, the Saturn V. This massive 363-foot rocket can lift 100,000 pounds into space and is still, as of this recording, the most powerful rocket ever constructed. This is the rocket that got manned to the moon and back. And after the Apollo program, it was used to launch America's first space station, Skylab. There were 17 Apollo missions, and each one will be covered in depth in the future through their own video. AS-201, or Apollo 1A, was not the first unmanned flight of the Apollo program, but it was the first to be given the Apollo name. It was launched on February 26, 1966 to test the Saturn 1B rocket and heat shield, but had an early shutdown. AS-203, or Apollo 3, was the next to launch, and it was designed to test the SIVB stage and its ability to restart in space. It was launched on July 5, 1966, and was a partial success, but did accomplish its primary goals. After that was AS-202, or Apollo 2, that was a repeat of AS-201, and successfully tested the heat shield on August 25, 1966. NASA seemed like it was ready for its first manned mission. This was planned to test the command module in low Earth orbit for two weeks. It was crewed by space veteran Gus Grissom, pilot Ed White, and pilot Roger B. Sheffy. Tragedy struck on January 27, 1967 as a fire broke out in the command module during a dress rehearsal and killed all three astronauts. Following the Apollo 1 tragedy, NASA had to go back to the drawing board and redesign the capsule. NASA would also retire the title Apollo 1 in honor for the brave astronauts who gave their life for the Apollo program. Apollo 4 was the first launch of the Saturn V, and it successfully demonstrated the SIVB stage's ability to restart in space. This unmanned mission was launched on November 9, 1967. Next was Apollo 5 on January 22, 1968, and this was the first flight of the lunar module, or LIM. It orbited the Earth and tested the LIM in space, including an aborted strategy called Fire in the Hole. Apollo 6 was launched on April 4, 1968, and it would demonstrate the translunar ejection capability of the Saturn V. Though it did not accomplish this goal due to engine trouble, it did give NASA enough confidence to start their manned flights. Apollo 7 lifted off on October 11, 1968, and it was the USA's first manned mission to space in nearly two years. They would test the command capsule in low Earth orbit, which would include testing the altitude meter and livability of the capsule. Apollo 8 followed, and it was the first manned flight of the Saturn V rocket. It lifted off on December 21, 1968, and orbited the moon 10 times, then returned to Earth. This was not only the first time had man left low Earth orbit, but it was also the first time man had ever laid eyes on the far side of the moon. Apollo 9 would be the first manned flight with a service module and limb. It lifted off on March 3, 1969, and would test the two additions in low Earth orbit. It also tested the Portable Life Support System, or the PLSS, that would later be used on the moon. 
The Apollo 10 was launched on May 18, 1969, and it was used as a dress rehearsal for the moon landing. It would come within 15.6 kilometers of the lunar surface, but would not land. They would instead test the redocking maneuvers required to get back to Earth from the moon. Then, on the 16th of July, 1969, the world watched as Apollo 11 lifted off from the Kennedy Space Center and carried its three crew members, Neil Armstrong, Buzz Aldrin, and Michael Collins, to the moon. Four days later, on July 20th, 1969, the Eagle landed and Neil Armstrong took his famous steps to become the first man to walk on the moon. On the surface, they collected moon rocks, placed a few scientific instruments on the surface, and tested man's ability to do tasks on the moon. Apollo 12 followed a few months later on November 14, 1969, and it landed in the Ocean of Storms. This mission was not only tasked to land on the moon and do some science, but it also had to land in a very specific area near the Surveyor 3 drone. The infamous Apollo 13 followed on April 11, 1970, and it had planned to land on the moon. Before it reached the moon's orbit though, an explosion in the command capsule caused the crew to abandon the landing and return to Earth using the lunar lander as a lifeboat of sorts. Apollo 14 launched on January 31, 1971, and did successfully land on the moon. This was the first moon landing with a color TV camera, and it was also the first to conduct material science experiments in space. Apollo 15 launched on July 26, 1961. This was the first time the astronauts got to drive the lunar roving vehicle, or moon buggy, around on the surface. The lunar roving vehicle would also be used for the remaining lunar landings. Then Apollo 16 left Earth on April 16, 1971, and would just continue the experiments on the moon. The crew spent a little under three days on the lunar surface before returning home. Finally, on the 7th of December, 1972, the final mission of the Apollo program lifted off. Apollo 17 would reach the moon and spend three days on the surface. This was also the mission that captured the famous photograph, Blue Marble, 1972. Then, on the 19th of December, 1972, the Apollo program ended, with Apollo 17 splashing down in the middle of the South Pacific. This would be the conclusion of an epic era in space exploration.